Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Last week was crazy hectic, four days, two conferences, board meeting, all sorts of uh, uh, events and such to go to in New York City, but I made it through okay. Uh, this coming week will be bit more taxing because there's going to be multiple 5.30 in the morning train trips down to Washington and Silver Spring, but eh, that's the job, you know? The plus side is, well, plus side is A, I get to do this show, but B, I also get to treat myself this weekend with the visit to a MOCA Fest in New York City, and that's M-O-C-C-A. It's a, well, cartooning and comics event that's uh, run by the Society of Illustrators. It's sort of an art comics festival. Um... I've been going for a couple of years, and one of the neat things about it is it's held about a block away from one of my favorite barbecue joints in Manhattan, Daisy Mays. Um, so I'm going to try and drop in on Saturday after I finish recording a podcast up in Harlem and see some cartoonists, get some barbecue, and um, well, again, that makes up for the, uh, the yo-yoing up and down on the Northeast Regional. Now, our guest this week, John Cuneo, is, uh, well, he's an artist who's going to be at Mocha Fest on Sunday with his new collection, Not Waving But Drawing, from Fantagraphics Underground. Uh, that is known as the FU imprint of Fantagraphics because they have a sense of humor. Uh, John is this amazing illustrator whose work I've enjoyed for a bazillion years, but unlike the cartoonist world, I don't really have a lot of entree into the illustrator side of things. So, uh, except when they work in in comics or or illustr or in uh, you know cartooning, so I was glad because I, I hit up Fantagraphics about potential pod guests from the the artists they're going to have at Mocha, and they suggested John, who's got a a new book out. Uh, he's been a freelance illustrator for almost forty years, and you guys know how much I love talking to someone who's you know made a lifetime out of their art, even if he doesn't really want to call it art. Um, now, John's new book, as I mentioned, is called Not Waving, But Drawing, and it's subtitled Dark Thoughts, Lightly Rendered, um, which is sort of appropriate. It is a series of, he doesn't want to say sketches exactly, or drawings. They're sketches that graduate into drawings, um, and they're watercolored for the most part, and they are what I like to call grotesques. Um, he bristles at the term when I mention it during our conversation, but he bristles at a lot of things I mentioned during our conversation, and that's part of the fun of it. Um, but there are some amazing works in this, uh, in this collection. John's a really wonderful illustrator. Um, and this book really gets at the, the absurd, the, the primal, the, the political, the basely political, because we live in a base age. Um, always the sexual, but to the point of, um, ridiculousness. Uh, so not waving, but drawing is going to draw you into this, like, sketchy, ugly, beautiful aesthetic. Um, and you'll laugh the whole way down, which is as good as I come, uh, when it comes to, to giving a blurb. So I want to thank Fantagraphics again for connecting us. Uh, and our only caveats on this one, uh, we recorded up at John's home in Woodstock and while it's pretty quiet up there out in the woods, his dog started barking a lot. Uh, it's downstairs and outside, but you can hear it. John eventually let him go outside so he could bark at my car and lie in the snow and, and that kind of settled things. 
Also, uh, for those of you who know a bit about John or the illustration and cartooning world, you might wonder why we don't talk about Richard Thompson, the wonderful illustrator and cartoonist behind Cul-de-Sac, who died recently from from Parkinson's, because uh, his illustration work kind of sort of has a lot of similarities to, to John's. And um, here's the thing. We talked about him off mic, and John's stories about Richard are much deeper and more important than mine. Um, and so I didn't want to bring it back up and pretend to be spontaneous, uh, on, on Mike about this stuff. Maybe we'll record something about it the, the next time. Also, um, John is one of the most neurotic guests I have ever recorded with, and he is not going to be embarrassed by my saying that. If anything, it's weirdly a point of pride. So here is John's bio from the flap copy for not waving, but drawing. John Cuneo is an editorial illustrator and cartoonist. He is perhaps best known for his New Yorker covers, in addition to which he has provided illustrations for Esquire magazine's sex advice column and has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times Book Review, Rolling Stone, GQ, and most other major magazines and newspapers. His work has received many medals from the Society of Illustrators, including the 2013 Hamilton King Award. His first book with Fantagraphics, Neurotic, was published in 2007. He lives in Woodstock, New York. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with John Cuneo. But let's start with asking, why so many dirty pictures? <laughs> why, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, thanks for... Just gradually, just easing into that. We'll start so off strong. A little bit, a little bit of, a little bit of a moment. <laughs> um, uh, well, Gil, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm, 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 out of the norm in, 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 in saying that I, I like sex. Uh, the idea of when I started doing those little sketchbook drawings and those sexual things, um, I was, I was, really woodshedding. I was trying to draw. Um, I was trying to change the way I was drawing. You mentioned David Levine earlier. A lot of us that come up working in pen and ink uh, or line drawings, I guess, um, I think we, we all, of a certain age, we all come under uh, various influences coming up in the world of, of uh, editorial uh, illustration. And, um, and I didn't like where, where I finally l stepped back and looked where I was, and it was just a collection of of uh, of influence that seemed that influences that seemed really obvious and sort of hackneyed and even dated by the time I was kind of imitating them. If it, you know, when I say influence, it's a nice way of of, of saying that I was kind of imitating some people. Um, and uh, and I I took it upon myself to start woodshedding, just to start drawing on my own. Um, and uh, in between assignments, uh, I was doing a lot of advertising illustration. I was living in San Francisco. I uh, was, wasn't doing much editorial stuff at all, but I was, you know, making a living doing a, a, a bad approximation of some of some illustrators' works that featured a whole lot of cross cross hatching and imagery and conceptual stuff that I was borrowing from a myriad of contemporary uh, illustrators and even some people that were, you know, um, by then a little bit dated. And I and I wanted to, like a lot of us, you go through a you go through a crisis of identity and saying, what really? If I left to my own devices, how would I draw? And as I was doing all that stuff in sketchbooks, um, and trying to just sort of put pen to paper and figure out just how comical my work was, what my people would look like if I was left to my own devices, how to draw them, the proportions of them, were they were they you know were they were they uh, how much realistic anatomy they had, how did the clothes look on them, what were the proportions of the heads to the bodies, um, all that stuff that uh, at least that I went through. I don't know, I, I make this sound much more complicated than it, than it probably should be, but uh, this has always been so vitally important to me, this this, this drawing stuff. Um, and, and just to pass the time, um, just since no one else was ever going to see these drawings, they oftentimes were naked. I find, you know, middle-aged men with erections to be hilarious to draw. <laughs> and and uh, and uh, yeah. not necessarily, you know, great-looking people or anything, but just they were involved in various acts, some of them, you know, and, uh, and uh, just because I was practicing and just to pass the time, it was more interesting to me than, than drawing, uh, you know, a, a woman carrying a bag of groceries was – a woman, you know, sitting naked on a on a on a on an ottoman, doing something unseemly to her 
partner or something. And uh, and uh, even the word Ottoman seems unseemly now when I put it that way. <laughs> uh, uh, and so they 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 I kept doing that, and eventually the sex stuff became more paramount, um, and uh, and uh, it didn't start off as anything but a, just a way to have fun to make myself practice if you have an instrument and you're and you're and you're and you're playing scales um and then you say jesus i'm sick of scales i want to play a little bit of a song and then you uh and then you know you finally get the notation to something like you know van morrison's moonlight and then that sounds kind of good and then you figure out how to maybe do a little solo in that moonlight and then you sort of uh realize that that's a lot more fun than and you want to do it at a different key and then you want to um, the, uh, eventually, uh, this was all just a way to avoid doing scales, essentially, is what it was. And, uh, and, um, and while I was practicing and getting better and hoping that I could draw better and find my own little, you know, not, I want to come back to the sound metaphor, but my own little editorial voice, the way I would draw people that would look distinctive, my line, my people, that kind of a thing. But sex has, you know, has also fascinated me for a long time. And, uh, and, uh, and I've got, uh, I've got. Um, a lot of conflicting feelings about that stuff and a lot of stuff that's, uh, uh, that I wrestle with. And, um, and I was being facetious when I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm maybe one of the guys that thinks about sex a lot because I think that a lot of us do. Uh, and, um, and so that's why it started out that way. Mm -hmm. That's why it started out that way. It's, uh, it's evolved, but yeah. Not in any sort of therapeutic or cathartic aspects. Mm. I mean, eh, that's well, behind everything you do, but yeah, you know, yeah, not you. I mean, people in general, but you know. Well, um, yeah. To to be frank, there is some. Uh, there there have been uh, some. Uh, I have. Uh, I wrestle with. I in my youth, I wrestled with a lot of that. I was very slow. Uh, I was a very. I was relatively. I had friends, but I was kind of an isolated kid, and I was you know I was having sexual experiences came later than a lot of my friends. Um, I, uh, you know, I played basketball for a reason and that was, uh, that was because I could spend many, many countless hours in my backyard with a light on in the dark shooting millions of jump shots and, uh, and thinking that sooner or later, you know, I would be able to be Walt Frazier or something. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but that was good for a kid that, you know, uh, liked to be alone a lot of the time and so was drawing and those two things, um. I mean, basketball also was a team sport, and I played a lot of that, and and uh, I, and, and I socialized enough. But uh, but for a loner kid, um, yeah, working those kind of issues out on paper, I guess. Um, uh, and it wasn't always that uh, that specific. I didn't put pen to paper and say, "I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna wrestle with my issues yeah. about that kind of stuff." There was some. It was a very unseemly um, episode. I feel like I'm part of a generation of men who as young boys went to two week camps in the Poconos <laughs> yeah. and had counselors who did unseemly things to them under the auspices, Gil, of tick checks. I, I okay. uh, you know, let's not even get into any more of that. You know what? This is this is right now. People are saying, "Jesus, can we go back to the episode with uh, with uh, Sam Gross or a cartoonist yeah. for the New Yorker or something?" Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, you know, I, I obviously have have processed that to the point and done enough therapy and working through that, whatever. But I'm not saying that that you know that even though that um, that the trauma of that you know fucked me up in some ways. And confused me in some ways, and uh, and you know we all wrestle with our our issues, even now in my in my in my old dotage, I am still uh, you know sort of like figuring all that stuff out and how much effect that had on me and how much uh, you know that affected my sense of of sexual of the repulsion of sex and the desire of sex and the you know and the uh, and the uh, and the, the boundaries of gender and the fluid aspects of. Uh, of 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 desire and lust and and love and all those kind of things and uh, you know not to not to put not that I'm working out heavy intellectual ideas with these stupid little drawings with of naked people but uh, but there's you know but there's something going on there and you start to see recurring images yeah. or themes and that's uh, I think more critical than you know a distinct one by itself in terms yeah. of yeah know. they show up again and again and yeah. uh, and uh, you try not to think about it too much like that giant tick wearing a camp council <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jesus, that's exactly <laughs> it right. It all becomes clear now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gil, thank that never you. occurred to me. <laughs> As soon as you leave, I'm hitting the sketchbook. <laughs> well, let me ask, though, about the – you have a new collection out now uh, of these sketches. You had one about 10 years ago um, from the same publisher, from Fantagraphics. The story I had read about the initial uh, collection getting done was that it was uh, not – against your will but sort of accidental somebody yeah. was passing your your work around and saying hey you know you should look at this stuff about publishing it and you were sort of um invited to that process a little bit later um this time around how did that differ um well uh this time around um uh it was not all that different except that uh, uh i had i continue to do um you know drawings in between my magazine and, and newspaper assignments and uh uh and uh gary groff wrote and said isn't it about time we did you know some kind of a sequel to uh neurotic and uh, i i didn't i didn't pursue that you know i don't i don't pursue these things i there's a, a large part of me that thinks that the world doesn't need these drawings you know and uh and i'm not my i'm not my biggest fan in, in that regard and and uh you can tell by my sort of like stumbling explanation for these things that's my big fear is like what well, you know what i have to what do i what, what happens if i have to justify um a doing these things and b you know um having them published so i'm um ambivalent about shopping them around i did a little bit once in a while i'll reach out i'll say well chronicle books maybe they want to do something or something like that uh, uh, but uh Literally, that's maybe the only publisher I think I approached, and I did that through a friend of a friend. And uh, no, it was because Gary uh, wrote and said, "Is it a time we uh, put together another collection?" And he was kind enough to say that you know that he um, uh, maybe unlike me was was uh, was proud of that first collection of having it published and 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 uh, with Fantagraphics. And uh, and I uh, and I said, "Well, you know, I I happen to have uh, eighty several hundred more." <laughs> <laughs> exactly, a drawer full of sketchbooks of more of the same. If you think that the world's demanding a sequel, um, and uh, so it's nice of him. And uh, yeah, I picked a few things out. And of course, that process is always from someone like me, who's you know innately insecure about the drawings and wishes he could do everything over again. And I know I could do it better if I had a little bit more chance. If I had just with less of a deadline, if I had more time in between assignments. Um, and uh, and uh, Gary was uh, there was a couple of emails where he said, just stop, don't start thinking about redoing drawings. Just send us what you've got and we'll put it together. And so I needed to be talked down from that particular ledge. There's a lot of ledges I need to be talked down from. Um, and that, these days it usually happens with emails and, uh, which is a less efficient way for to do it for people like me. But, uh, 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 but I, uh, but he just encouraged me to say, you know, pick, pick some drawings out and send them my, my way. And me being so technically, um, uh, of uh, uh, inefficient, I didn't. I, I had to send the poor designer um, one at a time. Every couple of days, I'd say, "I've got two more for you." I found, and I think my work for the book. And I would send them these things, and I said, "Just put these in a folder." I'm sorry, I can't send them in, in some sort of a larger. I know I should put, be putting them on. There's something about a SoundCloud, or there's something <laughs> about a, a Dropbox, or something. I said, but it's you know, it just eludes me. So I'm going to be sending you these drawings one at a time. So you know, a couple of months later, after one or two drawings every couple of days. The poor designer there, Paul, I think his name was, and did a beautiful job, um, uh, had enough to put together in a book. Mm -hmm. So that's how it worked out. It was it was just uh, by the benevolence of uh, of Gary Groth, um, who somehow seems like these things, uh, th th seems to think these things ought to be in print. I think yeah. it's a beautiful book. Thank but you. my question, and I asked you before we, we started to, to think about this, it's about a 10-year gap between uh, that book, uh, the, the original one and, and yeah. this one. Um the drawing style is different. Can you characterize sort of how the sketches have changed or were you, were you drawing in a particular style around 2006, 2007 for that one book? Or have you found a, a – this goes into the what have you gotten better at and what have you gotten right, worse at right. over the, the years. But Does this if, mean we can talk about pen nibs soon? That oh, would be feel great. free. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> As a guy who doesn't now draw, that would be fantastic yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, what's what's changed for you and how is the – how do you characterize the the just those two books yeah. as sort of milestones for where your art is? You no, know, it is different. I uh, I'll pick. I've got a you know I've got a drawer of those old sketchbooks. Those uh, from from the stuff that was uh, where that first book uh, the drawings were called from and uh, and 
I loved them. They were uh, they were you know hardcover, little spiral bound things, and uh, and I was working with a you know with a different kind of a pen. I think I was did most of those things with a repeatograph, and uh, and those were done with a little bit of a pencil underdrawing first, and they were more disciplined. I think if not disciplined, not I don't mean in a good way. I don't mean academically. Um, uh, a stronger drawing so much, but they uh, they were tighter, like you said, and uh, and um, and again those were done with no intention ever of having of anyone else ever seeing them. They're just they're just uh, a practice, and as more than one person has uh, has suggested, uh, uh, a cry for help, <laughs> and, 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 and 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 they. Uh, but the the and as I, as I kept drawing, you know, I want I, I I'm obsessed with trying to get better, and I've got you know benchmarks, other illustrators and artists, and that you know the, whose work I I uh, I admire and aspire towards that same sort of feel. A lot of us that you know draw for a living, we all um, we you know we get we get, we we want to get better, and uh, um, it's a it's a goal that I'll never you know attain, but uh, but but. You know, you still want to keep trying to do that. At least I do, and um, and uh, I got looser. I guess I, a lot of the drawings in this new book are just done freehand. Just started, you know, on a page without any, with a head, with a face, with a with an object, with an animal, and then uh, you know, and then I and then I kept drawing, and uh, I try to get myself in a space. Speaking of head, I try to get myself in a head space where I'm not thinking about the end result. I'm not thinking about this is going to one day be published. This has got to be funny. There's got to be a caption or there's not going to be a caption or this is going to be about sex or it's going to be about anything. Um, if there is a caption on those things, they're, they're added at the very end um, just to just a flailingly desperate attempt at context or something um, because, uh, you know, they don't really make – sense and they're not cartoons in in a way that they're trying to be look at them and laugh i know cartoonists for the new yorker and i love listening to them and you can tell just by the way they describe gags or they talk that they have an innate ability to sort of make something funny and i these are just drawings that uh that don't necessarily mean anything and i'm trying to free associate and i'm trying to keep myself from overthinking and uh and the drawing style has changed in that in 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 that same way. In that I'm using a different pen. Maybe I'm working a little bit quicker. Maybe I've been influenced by other people. Uh, I know that just by virtue of not using a mechanical pen, I'm able to draw a little bit faster. And uh, and maybe those 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 efforts at you know at being spontaneous um, uh, uh, are are uh, are aided by the fact that you know that I can I don't I don't have to work with such a deliberate line and again I'm not usually working over a a pre-existing loose pencil sketch like I was in those so they're uh, but you know the, the 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 downside of all that is that there are many 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 drawings sketches whatever that uh, don't uh, don't really pan out to be anything much except more sort of indulgence uh of of uh adult, indulging my obsession with just sort of drawing little people or animals and uh and you can say like that. more exercise than indulgence though yeah yeah more yeah. practice more exercise yeah. more more uh i uh the, the nature of having assignments um uh, uh being a professional illustrator uh for 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 magazines and newspapers um you know, you are obviously working under um, these restrictions and these boundaries and these deadlines. Oftentimes, a lot of my work has to do with a likeness or a caricature, um, and uh, and there are ideas that have to be approved. There are sketches that have been approved, and uh, and um, they expect they, there's a there's a something you I've often most of the time I've worked for these magazines before, and there's an expectation um, uh, and a standard that they expect, and uh, and when I'm done. I often want, as a palate cleanser, I'll, I'll I'll scan that drawing off and pick up a sketchbook and try to remember again what I really like about drawing, which is, um, which you know you can't expect to get every time you sit down to to do an assignment. Um, is uh, what I like about drawing is just a black line on a page and seeing what happens with that. Isn't there that clay thing about taking a line for a walk or something? Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, you know. It's a lot of walks, and and a lot of them don't lead fucking anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Is there a sense when it comes to assignments of 
let's see, either having to subsume your own style or when you're being assigned something, do they pretty much know, well, this is this is something we'd want in John's style? How much is that, that tension still exist, I suppose, in terms of editorial work or advertising work that you're doing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky um, it, uh, that now, finally, um, and for a long time now, um, I'm not hired to to look like anyone else. There are several illustrators. They're all friends of mine. They're all about the same age as me. And we all travel in that same sort of uh, artistic genre where um, with pen and ink and watercolor, oftentimes likenesses are involved. Oftentimes little comical scenarios are involved. Um, we're given an article and we're asked to sort of, you know, come up, illustrate it, come up with a, with a comic um, situation that, uh, um, to go along with it. Um, but, uh, there was a long time, many, many years when I started out that, uh, you know, you, the, the art directors had no problem suggesting that, you know, if this could look like an Ed Sorrell or if you could do anything like a Charles Saxon, that's, I wouldn't be complaining. I don't, I don't know if you'd do a lot of pencil work, but, uh, but I, you know, but it'd be able to be great. My, 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 my copywriter, and the creative director, we're, t we're talking about Saxon and talking about Weber and from the New Yorker. And do you ever have sort of anything? And I'm, you know, and I'm, it just makes your blood run cold, but and it's terrible. And I I have to say that I capitulated very early in my career. And uh, somewhere floating around out there are some terrible, you know, uh, either David Levine or uh, or Charles Saxon imitations that <laughs> that, uh, yeah. that I would disown now if I saw them. I'm sure I didn't sign them. But uh, yeah. yeah, so now they want me. For better or worse, mm -hmm. you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I've, and uh, and uh, uh, whatever it is that I do, I'm 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 asked to do it. Is there any concern that the um, the distinctness of your grotesques mm -hmm. is sort of um, I don't want to say limits, but you know, people would have a. Uh, how, how come yeah. you have no problem saying limits, but you can say grotesque? <laughs> yeah, I think grotesques is great because. Really? Well, it's actually a bigger question of mine. Do you think the the well the grotesque caricature that you 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 know have fallen into is really rooted in the fact that just like me, you grew up in suburban New Jersey. Do you think that? Uh, <laughs> I see. Plays so into is, it. This is uh, this is more environment than anything else. What well, what I have to assume nature or nurture, and right. when it comes to New Jersey, where yeah. nature is not really a good term to use. God, but. I wish you know. I, I remember growing up and thinking, and now looking back and thinking, God, if my parents had just taken me to museums, you know, or something yeah. like that. Um, and your parents weren't uh, particularly cultured by any means. Not right? at, not at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, my, my in fact, my dad, uh, while well, all the other dads in my block um, were going with. You know their trench overcoats and and their briefcases down to the train station to go to the city. My dad was backing up in a pickup truck and and managing a nursery and going the other direction and into Madison, New Jersey, where he managed a plant nursery, and he was really much more of a blue collar sort of a guy. And uh, not that those you know not that those uh, those dads that were catching the train were all you know cultural sophisticates who were you know going to the you know the, the MoMA on their lunch break or anything right. like that, but. Uh, but yeah, I didn't uh, didn't have any of that, and, uh, and I, I wish I did. I'm I'm still very insecure amongst many insecurities. One of them is that uh, I don't have any kind of an artistic education or background, and uh, I feel like I'm still trying to make up for that. Yeah, what do you think you, given the peers that you know and the experiences they may have had in education, what do you think you would have gained? Like, were, were there been particular shortcuts you would have you think you would have picked up? with a, a fuller artistic education? I think there would have been exposure, don't you? I, I would think that if I had gone to, uh, to you know, growing up in New Jersey and being a kid who drew, um, you were supposed to be going into the city for school mm -hmm. afterwards, um, uh, as it happened uh, because of some financial reasons that made it untenable and also because my family was in a bad place and then they moved down to... Florida in my senior year of high school and everything else it became a it it, it didn't work out that way but uh, but we never never could have afforded it anyhow but you know I had always heard about um RISD or Parsons or you know or SVA in the city and uh and that's where you know that's where people like me you know kids who drew this is where we wound up and I think it would have been ex I think I would have been exposed um to 
more than just the stuff that you and I saw coming up in Jersey. I'm older than you, um, but uh, but there was as much as I loved the uh, uh, you know the cartoons in the theater section of the Times. Um, who we're just talking about uh, Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld, yeah. or uh, my dad got the Daily News um, at the nursery, and there was an illustrator there who I really liked at the time, and the children's books that I was exposed to. And the styles that I, you know, had an affinity for. That's 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 the only thing I saw it coming up, and I figured that's how one drew, and that's how that's what one did was do a drawing, and that would be surrounded by type in a, in a magazine or something. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I didn't have any aspirations or even knowledge about fine art or whatever. But I think that if I had gone to art school instead of discovering, there was a uh, there was a uh, I went. My dad took me once into see a basketball game in New York City at the Old Garden and driving and walking back to our car. Um, and I still don't know the city well, but I know this this story is is is, um, is important in my weird little sort of like half-assed origin um, story is that uh, I found a, there was a mad magazine literally in the street, wet, and, and I picked it up. I was always a kid looking down, picking things up off the ground, and there was a copy of Mad Magazine, which I had never seen before. And I took it home, and I put it on the radiator that night and dried it out and it was just pretty much just like a stack of you know autumn leaves in the morning but i but i could make enough out to see these illustrators and and uh, and these these comic artists and uh, i had already been a, always been a drawer but this was some sort of giant new you know paradigm to discover about how you know my god all these people are drawing and they're making funny pictures and they're doing it in black and white and they're doing amazing work and but I often wonder what would have happened to me if I had if that had if I had discovered a soggy collection of Goya etchings, yeah. you know, on the on the on the sidewalks of New York. I'm sure people are you know throwing away old collections of Goya etchings all over the city these days. Yeah, I'll tell I, you, they, I, you, you see them everywhere. In the guy, I, I, yeah. that's the thing. Every time I see one, I think, Jesus, it's too late now. That time I got, that, I got that book at home and it's dry. <laughs> but if I had had it then, in my you know really impressionable age, I might have. Bit of contender, Gil. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I like to think that it, it would have been worse somehow that you would have just gone into like commercial art in a really ugly way and uh, just just never been happy and wondered, geez, if only I'd gone into editorial illustration or something, and I would have, you know. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, could have been. Maybe you know that's that's yeah, we can't mm. we can't uh, spend yeah. our lives full of regrets. No Although to, you and yeah. I have done a pretty good job, you know, spending our lives that way. That's right. Um, did that insecurity? How did that impact your? ability to um, accept the success you've had as an illustrator. And we're going to take it for granted that you actually have had success as an illustrator because you've been doing this for over 35 years. You're going to be leaping right into that without me sort of like being able to kind of... That's uh, the thing, because I know you, right. you would you would preface like this with not a success, and, but, uh, but yeah, I mean... you undermine that premise if you don't But you mind. built a career. Yeah. And that is that is a success by contemporary standards. Did it... Um, did your lack of, of training or background make it difficult for you in terms of like talking to peers and building relationships with other illustrators and artists? Did you have you always felt that you were sort of I don't belong here? Um, these guys know what they're doing and I don't. Have you gotten over that? I suppose you know a little. It, 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 there is some 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 wonderful process of of demystification. I'm sure. I sh I'm sure that you see this with all the people that who, who you visited and talked to and stuff. In, in that, once you see them in their in their room or see their sketchbooks or have them show you their sketches or this and that, I've been lucky enough to uh, have relationships now, although I'm much less social than I used to be, and, he, and it's always been a bit of a uh, it's been a bit of a problem for me. The uh, it's uh, 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 insecurity, I think, has kept me from from uh from pursuing um uh, a lot of that but i have reached out in in earlier in, in my life to uh people now that are close friends and who's and are kind of heroes of mine and i have relationships now with art and illustration heroes and uh and it means it it's just it it's world changing to see them in their in that context and see their sketches and see their struggles and talk to them about their process and no i guess to answer your question i don't think it's i don't think it's uh it's been a problem for me in um in terms of my 
artistic progression. But, you know, like I said, I just wish I had, I had maybe had more sophisticated influences when I was younger. Sure. Um, uh, uh, artistic influences. But, uh, but no, the, the, uh, the process of meeting people and being around them and, uh, and, uh, has been, has been edify, edif edifying in, 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 in that way. It's been, it's, it's, it's helped a lot. I got started as an illustrator uh, by virtue uh, because of my insecurities. I don't think I'm alone in that. In that, uh, in that, I you know was was an insecure kid for any number of reasons. And I remember doing a drawing and getting patted on the head for it. It was a drawing of a tree, and being the kind of kid I was, getting that kind of affirmation and uh, and being uh, and uh, you know um, that's all that that's partly all it took was like wow somebody likes this I'll do another one and another one and another one. And uh, after forty trees that in second grade, yeah. <laughs> I think maybe I might have worn out that welcome. But um, but yeah, uh, you know. So uh, uh, so um, insecurity is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Um, uh, it, it 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 can it it incentivizes you if you if you're able to process it in a way that you find you know that can be proactive. I think. Yeah, was there a um putting their pants on like anybody else moment for you with another illustrator that you actually saw someone's, do you remember seeing someone's work and saying, Oh, Holy crap. There's no, there's no magic pen he's using. This is the same set of tools I've got. And if I just work on yeah. X, Y, and Z, there wasn't a, a particular episode I could think of. I've had a lot of them as I've gotten older. Um, uh, but I, I, I made, uh, trips to, uh, to openings at the Society of Illustrators when I was uh, when I was younger and uh, was living in Denver or San Francisco or whatever and uh, not getting in the show or anything not having anything in it, but God forbid actually getting my work accepted in a fucking Society of Illustrators show um, but uh, at the time but I uh, but I got to see back in those days there wasn't any digital work and you know there were all originals up there and. Um, and you and just the just seeing uh drawings uh by these illustrators and seeing whiteout or patches or uh, yeah. or different yeah. things that that uh, was a great comfort um it to wasn't me because perfect it wasn't perfect yeah. exactly yeah. in your head you think you know these people are producing this stuff and uh effortlessly and without uh Without taking an exacto and scratching out, you know, um, uh, gouging out a line or something like that, and then you see older illustrations, maybe in some show, not not contemporaries, but you you see that uh, you know one of your heroes is, uh, is uh, Sullivan was is 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 a is a pen and ink guy that I greatly admire from the nineteen uh, twenties and uh, and. Uh, when I see his work and I'm looking at these books as we're speaking here, and I've got a lot of examples of his stuff in these books. Um, and it all looks so perfectly realized and assured. And, uh, you know, but when you do a little bit of reading about him and it's, and somebody talks about his work and how he obsessed over it and was tortured about, you know, uh, the process and how he worked very large and, and how oftentimes his work was more, uh, scraped away lines than it was lines. Um, <laughs> You know, and that it, it was it, when I've seen original uh, is of of his, they look damn near fucking excavated. You know, <laughs> right. and uh, and um, and that's a great belief. That's mm -hmm. that that can uh, for someone like me. Uh, you know, again, I hate to keep harping on the insecurity stuff, but uh, but because uh, I we we know we both know cartoonists and illustrators with a lot of swagger who don't seem to be tortured about that stuff. Or I'm assuming you do. Yeah. Please tell me who are they? Do you yeah, have any names? But they're all kind of really. Uh, uh... They've got their sense of desperation. I'm sure the only guys who have that vibe are like knucklehead superhero artists with, you know, giant you muscles. So? Yeah. I have a feeling those guys probably don't think too much about insecurity and just figure they can pile on more deltoids to their characters right. and, and, you know, compensate. Right. But yeah, I think for the sort of artists, or illustrators, artists, cartoonists, et cetera, who I talk to, you know, doubt seems to be a major, major factor in, in really? everything. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. let me ask though, you're, um, you mentioned the Society of Illustrators. You're actually, you know, a multiple award winner from the, the, within the illustration world. Did, um, did that help alleviate any of the insecurity, uh, being judged by your peers as, you know, these illustrations are among the best of the year in various categories? Did that 
help yes. at all, or did that make you think, wow, these awards aren't worth anything now? <laughs> oh, that Woody Allen thing you were talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> right. You don't want to really be, be a member of any society that gives you medals. Yeah. Um, uh, it, I guess it does a little bit. You know, early on, um, or, or, I mean, the society's been around forever, but uh, I, when I first started entering, you would, uh, they would contact you about getting accepted or not um, by by mail, of course, and um, and you would get um, uh, if you got in the show, you would get this big envelope with forms that were included in it that you had to you know that you had to fill out insurance forms and hanging fee forms and and more elaborate versions of who the art director was on the job and the medium and maybe a comment and in other words it was a it was a multi-page envelope that came in the mail and uh and if and if you didn't get in you got a very small business size envelope with a form uh, letter this is just like college well, back when really? I was 18, yeah, that, that was, if you got just the, the little letter size envelope, that was a rejection or a wait list. But if you got like the, the bigger, <laughs> thicker one, that meant there were forms inside and you actually got in. So. You see, well, you, yeah, know, so you I, didn't miss out on anything. I didn't, did you? Uh, not going to college. I never had to sort of uh, suffer the indignity of that. But yeah. God knows, I remember, I still remember um, very specifically whether I was living in an apartment building in San Francisco or, or, a, or, a, or a place in Denver or the, the walk down to the mailbox, opening it up and, uh, and uh, and getting that small envelope again year after year, so and that really never goes away for people like me. And I, I would imagine a lot of people that spend. Uh, I mean, you know, I've, I've spent decades of my life hunched over a table in a room by myself, and uh, and I'm not crazy about the person I work with. You know, it's just <laughs> it's it's uh, and 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 so that you know, and that compounds. And there's uh, uh, every day you you face. You know the challenge of a blank piece of paper. Well, I was my, my son wanted me, wanted me to watch a, 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 a documentary about cliff climbing and rock climbing and stuff, and uh, and there was some hang gliding involved and some parachuting and some free climbing and this and that. And I I find it all very interesting, only because my son finds it interesting, and I want to you know I want to desperately have something in the fucking world to be able to talk to him about. <laughs> and so I watched this thing last night. Um, but I. I think of what I do every morning as 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 cliff diving. You know, I mean, I, uh, f I f for all of us, we're we're looking at a blank piece of paper and making something um, out of uh, on that page on that giant, expansive, intimidating white field. Um, and uh, and so uh, uh, and then that for me, that insecurity doesn't go away. I, I once in a while, I will I will you know do something usually it's quick usually it's a drawing that uh, that I haven't labored over usually it's a it's something that I haven't thought about much and it has some panache some style some flair to it uh that I can look at and identify and say uh and say that's uh that's uh, that's what I'm after or I'm capable of doing that and yeah you know um in medals at the society of illustrators as 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 I'm I'm thrilled about that and uh and at the same time i know people that have gotten twice as many uh or more and uh and i also know people that i consider better than me that don't enter the show um and uh and so it's you know i uh i also have so much evidence of uh of 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 a of a, of a higher Sort of a plane, the uh, aspirational plane. I've got a, I've got a Edward, uh, a Ronald Searle drawing on the wall downstairs, and it's, uh, it's not some epic, you know, um, giant perfect example of his work. You know, um, uh, when you go through your little rolodex of what Ronald Searle's work, like people like me do, and you say, oh, there's that one about the angels in the museum, or there's that one about the. You know about the uh, about the guy on the horizon line, so and he's and he's you know and it's apocalypse in the background, and there's a bunch of cats, and there's you, I, I can think about all these uh, these uh, Ronald Searle drawings that I love, um, but I've got one on my wall downstairs, and it's uh, it was done for a uh, for one of his books about wine. I think I think the name of the book was something in the cellar, and and uh, and it's uh, it's a cowboy on a horse brandishing a, a red bottle of wine, and the horse is 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 uh, what happens when a horse is on its back legs doing what is that called? rearing rearing I it's think. a rearing horse yeah. Gil thank you I'm Perfect. not I'm not much of a horse person and uh, and I hope uh, you don't think I am you, I, you, I've I, never I, been I on a horse know. in my life really oh, yeah. yeah 
Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'm asking the wrong guy, but you knew rearing, yeah. at least. I read books. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I draw horses, and I still don't even fucking know. Yeah. Um, uh, anyhow, this drawing has so much, so much comic um, assuredness and so much restraint, so much, so much, um, so, such, such, so many uh, ephemeral, you know, um, hard to define sort of qualities that make it perfect in so many ways to me. And uh, um, the way the arm, the one arm juts up from behind this cowboy's head as, as this, as he's riding this horse and this horse is rearing back. I forget the name. Of, I forget the concept he was illustrating for this, um, but it's usually the whole book is about wine terms and things. And, uh, but uh, everything about it works so sublimely and so perfectly. And, I look at it every morning as I'm coming downstairs. If I feel strong enough and I have enough coffee, I'll glance at it before I head upstairs and I'll think, you know, this is something aspirational. This is the way to go, but I'm never going to get there. I've got a Richard Thompson on the wall that, that has the same effect on me and, uh, and, a, and a Barry Blitt and my friends Joe Chardello and Tim Bauer. And yeah, um, they, uh, these are guys that have, uh, you know, that operate on a level that I just aspire towards. And I don't say that, you know, Disingenuously, I, 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 I recognize that I, you know, I've got, you know, my moments, but uh, these guys live in, live in that world, and I'm, I visit once in a while to me. Did you have a, a holy shit moment of like meeting Sorrel or, or Ronald Searle, people like that, that were in your field, but a generation older and in that, that pantheon sort of level? Um, yeah. do, you, do you recall a sort of holy crap? They're not treating me like I should be, you know, picking up their pens behind them or anything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you and I were talking about, you know, Jules Pfeiffer and some of these guys mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, are in that generation who are, uh, who, you know, still stride the earth in, uh, uh, like giants casting huge shadows. Um, uh, I'm hoping I, to record with Sorrel at some point, oh, some point really? soon. I'm, I'm so hoping, well, you're gonna, but... First, you're going to you're gonna start calling him Sorrel. Sorrel. Um, yeah. um, Sorrel, Sorrel. Yeah. I remember when, uh, when... I figure uh, it'll be easier for me with Arnold Roth, because at least yeah. they're the name. Things, <laughs> right, you know, I'm right. Good. right. <laughs> um, uh, it, I have uh, been lucky enough to uh, to become friends with, with Ed Sorrell, and, uh, and I have been at his house, in his country house, I've spent the night at his house in a guest bed and uh, and didn't sleep because what happens is that you lay there in the dark thinking I'm spending the night at Ed Sorrell's house. The holy shit moment. The holy shit moment yeah. um, is, is a great moment, but it's not good for getting a lot of rest. <laughs> um, you know, knowing that in the morning he's going to get up and get, and, you know, get croissants in the neighborhood and you're going to be sitting there with Ed Sorrell having croissants. is uh, just like you were sitting the night before, you know, ha drinking doers. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's rife with... Uh, with my, you know, uh, self-editing sort of uh, process that I go through, where I'm, where I'm not really saying anything authentic. I'm saying, I'm, I'm in the back of my mind. There's a, there's a voice that's saying, to, saying to me, "You're having a conversation with Ed Sorrell. You know, you're eating croissants with Ed Sorrell. You're eating. He just French pressed a cup of coffee for you. You're drinking it in front of Ed Sorrell. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, not being in the moment. Not being in the moment. I have. <laughs> I, I can't recall. I'm not in the moment as we speak, in fact, but uh, but I'm doing my best. I'm doing, I'm trying desperately, <laughs> but there's a guy, there's a little voice in my head that's saying, you know, you got to slow down and not talk too fast and stop stop harping on insecurities and stop feeling being so self deprecating and that fucking voice in the back of my head is also telling you to talk, telling me to not talk so fast and I and the, and the voice in the back of my head is talks fast, so it's hard to sort of follow up with that. This is you not being self deprecating. This is me. <laughs> This is me doing just that. You really don't want to see me when I'm down on myself. But go, I'm kidding. I'm worse. Um, so because yeah. I, uh, I don't produce anything. You at least. Oh well, you know. You know, produce art, I, so. you know I don't know if that's. If, you produce work. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah. produce work. Um, but yeah, yeah, I got to know Ed, and yeah. uh, and he's not the easiest guy to know. He's famously prickly. He'll tell you himself um, uh, that uh, I asked him recently if he had gone to uh, Arnold Roth's birthday party at the Society of Illustrators. And he wrote me and said, and I'm not, I don't think I'm speaking out of, out of line to, to, to quote Ed on this, is that he said, I like Arnold a lot, but every time I see him, he's trying to cheer me up and it just depresses me. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's the kind of guy Ed Sorrell is. So the friendship is fraught. 
yeah. at best. Um, uh, and uh, but it is a friendship, and he has been very generous to me, and he's been give, he's given me advice uh, on drawing. Not all of it solicited, uh, but all of it, you know, received with gratitude. And uh, and uh, a couple of hours in his studio is not just humbling, but 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 it is such a lesson in how in in what it takes for some people to achieve the results that someone like it has, has achieved. There are there are tissue sketches upon tissue sketches and there is reams of reference and uh as he as from his generation what he calls scrap and uh and uh there'll be a scene in a town and there's a there's a there's a build, building reference there are people there are movie stills there are figure references there are pictures of taxi cabs he's and he's somehow making it all work and he's drawing with such a bravura sort of a sort of a uh courage because a lot of good drawing is is courage, I think, and uh, and uh, and and he has you know um, he has much more of that. I I will attempt to, yeah, compared to him, I'm approaching a page with a with a <laughs> fist, and a, you know, and a, and, uh, and, uh, and he is uh, he is you know he's drawing with his arm, you know, he's not with his wrist or with his elbow. He's he's and, and he's doing it over and over again and, and getting nuances right he's not just saying all right that's enough i'm going to make this work somehow it's the same scene and there's a stack of tissue paper um sketches or or uh or vellum or whatever he's working on clear print or whatever trying to get it right and uh God, he's just been he's just he's just uh amazing in that regard and he's still doing beautiful work i don't know if you saw the new york times cover store cover review by woody allen of of his last book but uh the Mary Astor uh, the Mary book, Astor book. Yeah. but yeah. Uh, you know, um, to to be eighty eight or whatever he is or eighty nine and uh, and writing me and saying I think I've still got one more book left in me I haven't decided what to do yet but uh, but this Mary Astor thing might be the first fucking book I've I've done that make that actually turns a profit in about forty <laughs> or fifty years and I'm happy to see that and. Uh, you know, God bless him. He's just a, he's just a, a, a force of nature. And that, that was my vibe with Pfeiffer. I mean, I'm sitting there with a guy who's 85, 86 years old saying, you know, it turns out I was supposed to be doing 150 page books all these years, Jesus. not these, these single illustrations. So I'm going to keep doing that until my brain and my hand give out. I was like, you just keep going, dude. You, Man. you make pages. There's nothing else you need to do right now, but make this book. You know, that's the, but finding that, that late. Yeah. Leads me to my question. Have you thought of long form at all? Is that anything you're interested in narrative? I know you've done like strip a little bit, you know, as a still within the sort of illustration concept. Uh, have you thought of, of, you know, storytelling in that mode and long form? I have, uh, only and not in any kind of a graphic novel sort of form. I'm not interested in drawing the same character over and over. And I'm not also in, interested in, in trying to, wrestle my mind into a place where I can have six or eight panels on a page, page after page after page, and be satisfied with the drawing. Mm -hmm. And when I say this, I'm not saying that my, you know, aesthetic is so refined or my standards are so high. I just know that it would be impossible for me to to do uh, pages of drawings without wanting to uh, redraw and finesse, and of course, ultimately ruin those drawings. If you, uh, you know, if you, you know, if uh, like we all know where we know it, yeah. it goes. Yeah. Uh, eventually, yeah. you just draw it into the ground, and it's yeah. you know dead on the page. And anything that you thought you had, um, you know, there's a there's a contradiction. Um, there's an oxymoron when you when uh, when you say trying to recapture that spontaneity. Those are two words that don't go together. Yeah. You know, that spontaneity is something you never get back. Act natural. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, the same sort of thing. Um, yeah, those are two words. That, uh, um, uh, that, we, that we repeat to ourselves again, exactly. again nonetheless. Exactly. But... I'm, in fact, that's a mantra going on at the back of my head right now, and it's not, <laughs> it's not happening. Um, but, uh, but I do think about, and I know this, you know, doesn't seem uh, like the most obvious thing in the world, having published a bunch of books uh, that are uh, there's. There's a couple books you, you know that I haven't mentioned to you that are full of you know these perverse little drawings of of uh, of, of, of 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 bad sex uh, and uh, and uh, and and uh, conflicted sort of uh, physical contacts 
with little comical people who uh, who should never be undressed on a page. Um, and uh, but I'm thinking about kids' books. I think about I I would like to do someday to uh, do a, a children's book. Um, and uh, and I'm not you know I, it wouldn't be the the fluffy bunny you know uh being tucked in and the mama saying you know this is how much i love you books as uh, if you if i go to barnes and noble now i i see um and i look at the children's books i uh i i, I don't see, see much that i can relate to but i do have colleagues um who have done really interesting books and uh they may not be in the uh you know they may not be uh uh in the top on the, on the bestsellers list in the uh, in the New York Times book review, uh, but they uh, uh, but they but they do well enough that they uh, that they're respected. The 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 the, the drawings in them uh, are uh, are lovely, and the uh, and the sentiment in them is not overly sentimental, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and you know and they are themes and they have a contemporary kind of a feel to them that uh, and I so it doesn't feel all that all that remote to me that I might someday be able to do that. Um, and that's as far as I've gone with it. I certainly haven't ever approached a publisher with an idea. And as far as I know, um, you know, you'd have to do uh, several books at least as a hired gun, as a hand yeah. um, for someone else to to write. And, uh, and it'd be presumptuous of me to think that I would walk in there and say, I've got an idea who wants to publish my book. But uh, as we speak, I'm looking at my shelf over there and I can see some books done by uh, colleagues and other people that I admire who have managed to pull it off. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so maybe one day, I don't know. I don't know if I could afford to do that. And I think I would have a hard time doing, um, you know, again, with that problem of doing 20 or 30 drawings that would look consistent that I could sort of like send off and say, okay, I'm done. And that I would be satisfied with, I'm sure I wouldn't be satisfied with, I'm not satisfied with the drawing I sent off to the Atlantic <laughs> yesterday, you know, but maybe deadline and stuff, the regular incentives would keep me from, from, you know. The threat of legal action is probably a good way to, <laughs> to, 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 <laughs> to that thing it. hanging over me, anything yeah. I can do, you know, whether it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So to keep me from, uh, uh, on, on schedule and from overdoing things. Yeah. Yeah. Are there public figures you, uh, particularly enjoy drawing for Atlantic, New Yorker, et cetera? Are there, or are there figures, conversely, that you're just like, Jesus, do not ask me to, to draw a person X? Um, well, there was uh, back when uh, a lot of us, when I talk about us, this collectively, a lot of these colleagues that I might have mentioned in passing that uh, that uh, worked for magazines that wanted little likenesses and caricatures. I'm thinking of Entertainment Weekly and Us Weekly specifically back uh, decades ago where they would you know, have uh, have a whole lot of illustration in it, and all of it celebrity based. Um, uh, and uh, you know, what's an, an, an anathema to uh, to a lot of us is is a young TV actor um, with an unlined face and a, and perfect uh, features. I think and, I think Charles Burns talked about that. How he swore he would never draw the cast of Friends again <laughs> <laughs> after like X number of, of yeah. for Entertainment Weekly back in the nineties. That's so. exact. Yeah, I, I've I've got uh, a few drawings in those flat files over there that you will not see for that very reason. But uh, and then there are people. I did the whole family of. Uh, um, Our first Donald, family, Donald Trump, uh, uh, for uh, for the New York Times Book Review, and a few interior drawings uh, for some piece of fiction they ran um, on the cover that they actually commissioned uh, about the Trump family, and uh, that they had never done this before, and uh, and I was, you know, and I was happy to do the gig, and uh, and uh, and had drawn him. Uh, Trump, uh, Melania was featured in this, but the whole family's in there, and uh, and and Donald and the several interior drawings. And I remember thinking, well, this I'm going to get this guy down, um, and I've got a you know, and I've got a little uh, stack of of decent enough photos and uh, with enough work on it, I figured I could maybe I got you know I got a handle on that face, um, and I was very, but at the same time, I was very happy that it was going to be just a short-lived thing. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, before the election, I literally had this folder. Uh, I was so repulsed by the by the subject. Um, 
that I uh, uh, that I had this folder of, of, of stuff, and I was going to ceremoniously make sure that I personally put it in the in the uh, recycling box uh, one morning uh, on when the trash came after the election, and uh, <laughs> I, and of course I also uh, now um, remember to my chagrin um, of retrieving it from the uh, <laughs> from the fucking recycling file and giving it a place in my you know in my reference files now and uh, and it's growing and it's uh, and it looks like I'll be drawing this guy for years to come years to come he yeah. does make a few appearances in your your new book which i, I thought does. were pretty entertaining yeah well it's cathartic for me to uh, to to draw him um in ways that uh, no one else uh not 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 draw him better but just doing things that mm. uh, uh that i don't have to worry about you know ever being well, I guess they are published, aren't they? But the, I'm, the, all I'm saying is that the New Yorker is is not going to be uh, considering that that for cover material. I uh, my 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 personal um, sort of feelings on 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 that is that I am not a sophisticated you know political satirist, and uh, and so I have no problem when uh, when uh, when he goes low, uh, I go lower. Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm what I'm thinking. <laughs> Now you mentioned your uh, your son having uh, no interest whatsoever in what you do. Um, was that deliberate on your part to try to keep him out of the family business uh, for fear that you know his life would also be filled with with <laughs> illustrator desperation? Or <laughs> my son is is not the guy that is gonna that would ever want to spend um, you know four or five decades in a room by himself. He's mm -hmm. a very social guy. He's got a good sense of himself. He's happy in his skin. He may not even be my fucking kid. I was going to say, you're yeah. sure he's I'm yours? not even sure <laughs> that we we should probably do some sort of a DNA thing because, um, and uh, and uh, and I am grateful that not 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 so much for uh, for the lifestyle, but I I I uh, I, I would be too. Um, uh, What's the word codependent? If if I knew that he was following in my footsteps um, or anybody's footsteps uh, uh, that that did something like this for a living, I want if if he did it, I'd want him in a room with animators in San Francisco working yeah. on a uh, 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 working on a uh, you know on a on a on a show for uh, for some hip network on uh, mm -hmm. on cable. Um, but no, there's no worry about that. He he's uh, he likes to draw a little bit. I I. Probably, I, I'm sure I, I made a mistake. Uh, I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes uh, ha, uh, uh, on the way up with him, but uh, uh, but I took great care as to not um, discourage him um, and to gently sort of uh, gently guide him when he would when he would draw when he would come into the studio here and and or had assignments in school or whatever. But inevitably, there's a standard that uh, I think that he talked himself out of seeing his dad do this that he he just thought that makes you know. sense at yeah. the same time i've got uh, my friend barry blitt uh uh who's uh, who's another genius right along there with richard thompson um uh his son sam um is uh his drawings he's he seems to have gotten whatever gift his dad has and and seamlessly inherited it and uh and uh is uh is a marvelous draftsman and uh and more than that, has a has a comic sensibility in his drawings and everything else. I don't even know if Sam's doing that, wants to do that for a living. He's got a lot of aptitude for a lot of things. Um, but uh, but my son is a social animal and uh, and and is uh, is a, a great guy and seems actually healthy mentally and uh, and uh, and I would not want to uh, inflict this world on him. <laughs> <laughs> taint any of that with any suggestion that he think about you know career in the arts would be wonderful for yeah, you, kid. yeah yeah you mentioned making a living um and this being a, a career it's been almost 40 years that you've been doing editorial slash yeah. freelance yeah. illustration i've been a freelancer yeah how's it changed um we know the technology the 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 number of venues out there etc what do you see as the biggest changes in the the market for you for someone in your field over that time, well, you know, we were talking about how some of these guys that uh, that uh, are now doing 
uh, graphic novels and things like that. Some of these, uh, you know, I've, I, I don't know if you've met Seymour Quast, you know. But, uh, we talked about getting together. Yeah, we I met him at an SOI event. Yeah, he's yeah. another guy that, you know, like Jules Pfeiffer, um, that uh, is now doing, um, in addition to Seymour's ongoing editorial career, is uh, is doing, you know, graphic novels and stuff. And these guys just, um, just continue on um, uh, and find other other avenues for uh, for their drawing, not just uh, waiting for a magazine to call and say they've got a quarter page to fill. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, I've seen Seymour's stuff, and I think it's in Kennedy Airport, uh, you know, over a bar, and I've seen and I've seen him, stuff he's done for, for uh, branding and, and, uh, and other aspects of his work, in addition to doing beautiful, you know, illustrations and, and about, about, and drawings about war and a show that was published into a book just last year or something. In addition to him continuing on with his uh, with his graphic novel sort of schedules and stuff, I I'm I I think that I'm uh, more anomalous now than uh, 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 when I see slightly younger illustrators that are doing murals or are doing um, drawings on the ceiling of a uh, of a of a of a retail store. Uh, I saw something of a colleague of mine, Josh Cochran doing that on a, you know, and I know that he's, and I don't know how these people get this work or another colleague who's drawing the last days of the Carnegie Deli. And, uh, and then it's published in New York magazine. And, um, they're, they're very proactive, I think about getting their work. I don't think they got a phone call saying, you want to come over here and draw. I think, I think uh, my friend Julia Rothman uh, talked to again to Josh Cochran and said, "I want to get over there and draw the Carnegie Deli. Do you want to come with me?" And it's like, "Well, what a great idea, yeah. you know." And meanwhile, I'm sitting in here saying, "If I've got a spare moment, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe pitch a New Yorker cover, or I'm going to uh, draw yet another sort of a thing in a sketchbook." That uh, and uh, but these guys are are actually going out there and finding other avenues for their work. They've got a skill, and they're applying it in a lot of different ways. I was asked a few years ago to go to the uh, go to uh, Augusta, Georgia, and and draw um, for Golf Digest um, to do a bunch of drawings um, uh, during the Masters tournament, and uh, and uh, you know, in other words, it was excuse my French, but it was reportage, Gil. Mm, yes. Yeah, how's that? <laughs> I'm being all snooty. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll come back to Earth here in a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and uh, and you know, I was typically flummoxed and anxious and nervous about the whole fucking thing, and and it turned out to actually be fun and the fact and i realized as i was standing there with a sketchbook on the ninth green that you know i can do this this is the same thing i do anyhow i'm yeah. drawing and uh and uh but now uh, there are expectations so but now right about it. right yeah. yeah right um uh but um and of course i did more drawings and they then i i overcompensated and you know i've got the uh i want to i want to have people you know like me and and i want to people please and i you know sent them reams of drawings that i had done um but it worked out okay, but it took a phone call. It never occurred to me. And I've yeah. got other friends who are pitching things to other magazines and are coming up with ideas and are coming up with, with uh, ways to either either brand their work or to apply it to uh, different sensibilities than, like I said, just filling in a quarter page or a half a page uh, for a magazine and waiting for the email to come mm -hmm. or, back in the day, the phone call to come. And, uh, and so in that regard, I, I, I think – uh, things have changed just because I see I see people um, being much less passive about uh, about their careers, and I don't know if they're learning that in school or if there or if there's a you know a whole sort of a you know paradigm shift in terms of how you uh, how you can manage your career in a in a much more um, positive sort of a way where you're less we are not waiting for things to happen to you but you make things happen but there's a lot of that going on and it mystifies me because i am by nature a uh, you know sort of an isolated guy and uh, and i see this stuff mostly on facebook and then i uh, i read it and i and i and i and i i am impressed and envious and uh, and curious and then I turn the and computer off. Ends. Yeah. yeah. Then I turn the computer <laughs> and I go back to the couch with my sketchbook and I say, "Well, maybe I can do another person with a pencil in his ass." You know, <laughs> Jesus. What you've mastered? I have but, but so mastered. There's, there's always it, nuances to that. There is, yeah. you know, what's that? Milton Glaser said that you know the reason he had so many different styles is that uh, 
is that he always felt that once he mastered one, he would move on to another. And I keep waiting for that to fucking kick in, you know? <laughs> Where, when, is, when do I decide that I've got this down, this stuff? And, uh, you know, some of us find uh, endless ways to refine this little niche that we have, I guess. And other people, like, you know, Mr. Glazer um, uh, can step back and say, I've mastered this, and now I'm going to be moving on to pastels. I'm going to be moving on to something else. Uh, uh, I don't see that happening with me. Well, I guess that was the, the question that I sort of asked at the beginning that we, we diverged from because both of us kind of veer all over did the I, place. Did I these. diverge? I'm what sorry. Have, what have you gotten better at? I, we were talking about that in yeah. the context of the two books, but, but really over the course of drawing, what do you look at and say, you know, I am so much better at X than I was 10, 20 years ago. I, oh boy, now you're forcing me to find something positive about my work uh, off. Uh, <laughs> I know this, this is the, the, the single moon. worst thing I will do to you this entire conversation. Uh, I, I think it, uh, that I am a little better at putting my people into environments than I used to be. Hmm. You know, what happens is you fall in love with drawing your little faces and your little people. And then somebody gently tells you, you know, those little people have to be doing something. They just can't be standing looking at you and they've got to be looking in different ways and they've got to be able to, you've got to draw them in different. And then you've got to put them into context. You've got to have, when an article for Field and Stream comes, you've got to make those people, you know, uh, doing something, hiking or, or aiming a gun. And maybe you've got to put an animal in it. And that animal just can't be in a you know that animal's got to be in, in 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 the woods or on a rock or in a mountain, and there's got to be, and you've got to put those things together. And uh, it sounds so obvious and elemental, and that you should, you know, that I should know that right off the bat. But uh, you can, you know, you can just get so enamored of 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 the way you work and your and and uh, that you can you get frozen if you're at all if you have these security issues or whatever because what you've got to do then is say all right this animal has got to live in the same world as, as these little people and they've got to be drawn with the same sensibility you can't you can't draw a uh you know a a a a bison um realistically being you know and having an having a indian on a horse shooting that bison and have that horse look like it's out of a horse drawing book, but you're Indian looking out of how you draw people and that bison looking out of uh, some courier and Ives etching or something, you know. Yeah. Um, and so you have to be able to learn how to draw the world. The car you draw has to look like the same, it isn't the, that is that exists in the same world as your people. And uh, and that's that was difficult for me. And I feel like it's more organic now and more natural that I think I can do that. It doesn't look such – there's not so many glaring um, inconsistencies uh, uh, in, in, a, in a drawing. I think that uh, – I hope that, you know, everybody looks like they're, they're, they come from the same source of, of my hand and not from some sort of uh, – and it's not that discordant element where it's like, holy shit, this guy, you know, that's a funny person. But the uh, but the desk he's writing at, and uh, and the uh, and the plant next to the desk, and the uh, and the, and the dog that's uh, sleeping on the on the on the rug next to it looks like that's all out of a you know Norman Rockwell painting or something. Yeah, a swipe from here. A swipe, right? yeah, yeah, from my swipe file, as Ed Sorrell would say. <laughs> yeah. What brought you to Woodstock? Uh, and what keeps you in Woodstock? I uh, uh, well. Um, the, the, it's not too personal a question. No, it's not personal. Yeah. I just, uh, I just didn't. I, it just feels uh, maybe a little tedious, but uh, as opposed to the rest of this interview, which is just riveting, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure you have a short pithy answer for this too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the pithy version is that uh, we were going to, uh, my wife and I were going to adopt a, a Chinese orphan, and for various reasons, after a lot of book work and money spent and prep work, and we were living in Denver at the time. Um, it, that didn't work out, and we were at the age where we thought we might have one more move in us. I am my, what I do for a living is, is of course, um, transportable. It can, you know, I can do this anywhere. And uh, and a friend came through town, a colleague who was who was an illustrator living in Brooklyn, 
where all the good illustrators apparently live and uh, now uh, and and uh, said that they were he was shopping for a, a little uh, weekend cabin upstate and he got in our computer and said look what we're looking at and uh, he was staying he and his wife came through on a road trip across the country and stayed with us one night and uh, and we looked at that and we said wow we could we could afford a weekend cabin in, in Woodstock we couldn't afford a you know a, a, an apartment in Brooklyn but we could actually move to Woodstock um, uh, and uh, if we sell our place in Denver and and being uh, the, uh, the 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 shrewd financial operators that we are, we sold just before um, which, uh, Denver's blew up, and uh, and we could have got two or three times the amount of money for our little our little arts and crafts um, uh, cottage in in, uh, in in Denver than uh, than we uh, did. But we managed to find a little place here in Woodstock, and it all happened very quickly. It was all very spontaneous. I think of myself as a city person, and I didn't think it through. And <laughs> and here I am in, in the woods, and we're looking out the window of the studio, and there's nothing but snow, and the dog's barking a deer, and there are wild turkey, and there's – my wife con is convinced she saw some mountain lion tracks when she was snowshoeing out here before, uh, before you came over. But uh, – yeah, here I am for better or worse. I work on a, you know, on a little 24 by 24 inch square no matter where I am, right. whether I'm living in San Francisco or in downtown Denver or or whatever and uh and uh and so uh and so and my son um came up through school here and liked it. It's a great place to raise a kid. Um and uh and my wife my wife works here locally and it's it's all worked out, but I uh, how, how I've stayed here. When you asked why have I stayed here, I've stayed here in spite of the isolation. Uh, I, I find it um, a little bit, uh, uh, even for my um, loner standards, uh, I uh, it's 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 I, I will say that it's it's not easy. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, I uh, I don't think we're you know I don't think a move into a uh, into the city is is in the cards for for us nowadays, but. Uh, but it has been a it has been a there has been a lot of compromise in that regard and the fact that uh, I can't walk out of the house and and walk to a coffee shop that easily um or uh, be distracted or uh, wander around a city and get out of my head um uh and uh and uh, so uh but you know it's uh, it's a nice little house and it's a nice little room and uh it's as good as any other room uh in any other city that I've grown in I should ask because Michael Maslin brought it up funny history with the house Yes. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a laugh riot, Gil, but it's uh, funny wise. Is it but interesting? It's, uh, right. It is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the uh, the the uh, I I was a fan of the of the band, the the rock group, the band. Um, uh, and I don't know if you know, I, know the I demographic the, of your listeners. The Levon Helm Memorial Highway I turned on to <laughs> uh, when yes. I headed up here. So oh, yeah. Woodstock uh, does <laughs> like their uh, their memorial highways. Um, and uh, and they loved Levon and uh, who didn't? But uh, but this property was all owned by the uh, Albert uh, Grossman, the um, the manager of of Bob Dylan and the band and Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and a lot of other musical acts. There was a big tract of land up here on the top of this little hill that he owned, and uh, and he started a restaurant in town and the Bearsville uh, recording studio is uh, is. Uh, it was formerly is is just a couple of yards up the hill from here, and uh, this house was a uh, uh, was a, a, one of the many buildings where uh, that he would put up bands and uh, who were recording up at the Bearsville studio, uh, bands that he managed, um, bands that uh, other bands that came up here to uh, lease the space and record up there at the uh, at the studio, and uh, and uh, so um, so this house has a a lot of history in in regards to having. Um, hundreds of different bands uh, uh, sleeping here in this little this little warren of rooms on the top floor and what was used to be kind of a decent rehearsal space in the bottom floor and uh, and all kinds of atrocities were committed here <laughs> in terms of uh, you find uh, any uh, hash or anything in uh, the radiators you know and stuff. <laughs> there was a the, the, one of the bathrooms has has a wooden um, sink around it a uh, wood with with a cigarette burns next to the toilet where any number of musicians <laughs> must have nodded off while smoking and trying to go to the bathroom and uh managing not to burn the house down. managing not to burn the house i've, I've got uh, three people in town have told me that they have had sex in this house two of them told me that they had sex in every room of this house nice. okay. which 
is something where I'm I don't know if your listeners need to know. I I have not accomplished. <laughs> um, at least not with not with a partner. Well, as um, long as your wife's not listening, we're good. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Um, uh, and also, um, there are there are YouTube videos of the band playing in our living room. Um, uh, it misidentified as Big Pink, um, uh, uh, which is of course where they did live and play and recorded albums. But the uh, stuff that's on YouTube is uh, is our living room, and right. Uh, it's right there. And uh, and I happen to have been. A fan of the band. I remember somebody growing up in Jersey turning me on to them when I was very young, and I've seen them perform in, in Madison Square Garden with Dylan and things. And uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, Robbie it's, Robertson puked where I'm right, sleeping. That's right. got to be a good, exactly. <laughs> good feeling. Exactly. I'm one of a million houses in Denver where people insist that Bob Dylan, you know, yeah. um, but uh, but Bob Dylan was, according to an elderly neighbor down the street who remembers all this stuff and is and is a font of information and 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 verifiable information and uh, has no reason to lie. She did tell me that her basset hound treed Bob Dylan in my yard. <laughs> so uh, which is something you won't, you know, you won't you won't find out about if uh, you read the regular bios. <laughs> I uh, did mention Michael Maslin, which uh, raised a question I have. I've interviewed a bunch of New Yorker cartoonists, but very few illustrators. Um, rivalry between those two sects, or do you guys unite oh. against the prose writers at, <laughs> at the New Yorker? Is, is there a hierarchy uh, like that? Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, I I I don't. No, no, I I'm just, not one of those cartoonists. I'm, yeah, yeah it, right, uh, right. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. you know, I think we both look upon one another with a with a with mutual respect, and I I cannot for the life of me understand how people like Michael and Danny Shanahan and a few other cartoonists who I've met um, that work for the magazine have uh, can manage the weekly. The look day rejection vibe? rejection the I, weekly I, rejection. Yeah. Do you, do you Bruce, are, are you like me? Do you not years? have enough rejection in your life? No shit. I you know, look at them. Like, How could you possibly keep coming back? Oh, I, I, my you know. God. And, uh, and so when we talk about cartoonists being mentally ill. That's, that's the, well, okay. you know, I, I can't. I I I get emails from people that actually want to hire me for for a drawing. I mean, they by name they write me and say, "Can you do this illustration?" And I'm lucky to get that. I can't. I, I can't imagine these guys weekly showing up and and practicing a profession that for, for which a, a a large percentage of the work they produce they know will be rejected. It just it just boggles my mind. These guys are so gifted and so talented, and uh, and yet they have. Um, you know, they walk into a room where a guy flips through, um, and uh, nope, and nope, right in person nope. there says no any number of times. It, it, it just when I, I watch that little documentary uh, about it uh, with, yeah. with Mankoff, it was just like they go through. They're willingly going through this uh, again. It's nice when you get people at a certain level who just send in their their stuff, so at least they're not walking in the door. But you I know, I talked with Ed Corrin about it when Ed started. His very first pitch was bought in like 1960 or something. Oh shit! Nothing for 18 months. Yeah, right. He thought, well, you just walk in, you sell something to New Yorker, and there you go. That that was that, how that, it was going to work. That would have been that's the kids. Maybe they maybe that was a diabolical way to kind of keep him coming back. Was yeah, just, to just, just mess like, with him from there. <laughs> what did Ross? Just, what does Ross Chas say about that? I mean, I can't I imagine that in. this Pulitzer Prize winning you know brilliant yeah. woman actually has to go through that as well. And uh, but they submit. You, they you submit. submit. That's what they, they do. They email stuff in. That's where uh, it starts think, for them, I guess. No matter what happens, she wouldn't get to do that book that she just did or the book she does without the fact that she is a New Yorker cartoonist. And, and being a New Yorker cartoonist uh, is contingent upon throwing yourself against that uh, – your work against that wall every week and having uh, – and Yeah, and uh, I assume there's some staff side vibe. I don't know if they're 100 percent – Freelance, freelance at her level, but yeah, but still, there's a degree of yeah, we're not we're not running anything of yours for you know Jesus x number of weeks. Yeah, it just seems so damaging. I I uh, I, 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 I it mystifies me. Um, but uh, then again, you know, they you know you build a strong constitution and you're and you're you know and maybe you uh, you're confident about selling your work somewhere else, but where else? You know, yeah, I don't that's, know. and that's part of my question about the how's the market changed for you overall. You know, the number of magazines is diminished. It has, um, but at the same time, you're you, you consider yourself relatively well ensconced with a couple of good. I I, I guess maybe just 
just uh, because of, uh, you know, attrition. Um, you well, know, I just... ran my entire career by attrition until a few years ago. <laughs> Literally, people either retired or died ahead of me, and nobody suspected it. I mean, uh, I kept moving up <laughs> based on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I Again, I've, I've used the word lucky many times and uh, during this interview, and uh, – and when you uh, when I do get out and actually talk with colleagues uh, and I hear some of them that are desperately trying to get teaching gigs now, or they talk about things drying up or they uh, or they talk about the, they're almost feel they, they look they're kind of damaged and, and glassy eyed and mystified. It's like, Jesus, there was a time when I just thought this would continue on forever. Yes. And uh, and uh, and so not that I'm you know, not that I've got uh assignment upon assignment stacked up all the time but i do have uh monthly gigs now which i used to dismiss as as uh in a uh and uh not dismiss but take for granted or almost treat as as an irritant like god i'd rather be doing these other gigs that come in but i've got these monthly things they're going to have to now those are lifelines those are you know the things that i do for atlantic every month or for garden and gun magazine or for dartmouth or a couple of university magazines or for different people those are things that i i i i think back and think god how did i have the uh how dare i have you know be so dismissive about these and not recognize that uh, that I was one of the uh, one of the blessed people here to to have these gigs that re- are a recurring gig every month to to pay the mortgage and to uh, keep us going here um it's a uh, uh, you're right about I never did finish that 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 answer I guess about the magazines but you seem to intimate that 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 you know what, what's happened with the publications and stuff magazines there's less of them the budgets haven't changed in 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 decades oh, that now. I've, I've heard yeah it's and, the same uh, number that it was yeah. in like 1983 um, and uh yeah. yeah i'm going down to speak at some school um next week and uh and uh i uh it's not with it's it's with no small amount of uh of of uh I assume trepidation, trepidation because that seems to be the the dominant mode back there is, for you. That's, yeah, that's, a yeah. little bit of yeah, yeah. There's a little <laughs> bit of a, there's no no small amount of trepidation uh, just getting up in the morning, Dale, and this and the school trip is is no exception. But uh, you know, but I do con- I do get concerned about in uh, in encouraging these people just by by just by my presence there and by talking about my my work and showing it or whatever. Um, am I, uh, implying that there's a longevity yeah, that yeah. you two can have a 40 year career doing this. Right. Right. Which is the last thing you want to right. inflict on anyone. And, but then again, like I said, a lot of these kids come out of school with, you know, animation skills and much and, and Photoshop skills and, and, uh, and, and a much more of an awareness of other ways to apply their, their, uh, their, their abilities, um, whether it's anything from children's books to greeting cards to interactive things to, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, f- to ways. I always – I start that sentence and I always go to, uh, you know, you know the other stuff, the other stuff that I'm trying to talk about, you know, but I don't even know what the fuck it is, but it's, there's other stuff. <laughs> no, there's, 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 there's things they're doing. There's other things they do. I still don't even know what it is, but uh, – but they manage Cross platform content exactly. management. What is this? I, I, I was going to come up with one of those phrases yeah. that kind of multi platform cross <laughs> centralizing sort blah, of blah. a synergistic thing that they do. And it's uh, now, yeah. have you ever done any teaching? Uh, n- I, I, I occasionally will go somewhere and stand in front of a uh, stand in front of an audience and talk too fast and show my work. But and, a and single forty five like minutes, that, as opposed of, yeah, to a, okay. of uh, of, yeah. uh, of a tedious self deprecating forty five minutes of, of of show and tell. And then what I do is. I, I do a demo. No, you're, you're <laughs> no, it's not that. I, I, I get up, I, I draw. I do yeah. a demo. It, that's usually inherent in my visits. Um, and uh, maybe I'm, I don't know uh, how many people still do that, but I I get a piece of paper and people crowd around and I take a pen and I draw and then I put some watercolor on that drawing. And, uh, and uh, I'm feeling more and more like some, you know, some archaic sort of a, sort of a, remnant of another time or whatever but uh but people like to see you know that stuff uh, that it can actually come from a hand yeah in front yes, of them and not, i guess not, and i'm not saying that there's not a lot of uh young people come up who have you know a beautiful line and draw beautifully or whatever but uh it, it at least it makes me feel like uh you know if i'm gonna all i really do is draw and if i'm gonna if i'm gonna be going there i don't have a, i'm not a font of advice or encouragement or or that kind of thing but at least i can say listen it's it's still okay just to sort of like you know um, take a take a big piece of watercolor paper and, and start drawing, and then take this you know these watercolors and 
fill in between the lines and uh and there's a there's a there's a there's a skill set that still you know that, that can still be applied and and get you can get paid for i guess mm-hmm. right i'm looking at you now with a questioning you look get like paid for looking this? for some sort of affirmation <laughs> tell me i'm right Gil. you're talking to a guy who spends a sunday driving all over the goddamn place <laughs> to record conversations but yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, any other message for goddamn kids today oh those kids um no i don't have uh i don't have any i, I often get a uh emails from uh from students who i think there are assignments in art schools where they're said where they where they're supposed to contact an illustrator they like and ask them these questions and uh they say edward uh, sorrell didn't get back to me so i'm hitting him yes yeah, jesus god i hope those people didn't <laughs> contact ed first because you know that might just really i would never even take up a pen again he could he could sort of like break you down um if he would even you know answer, answer a, yeah. a fucking email but uh um, hell, I'm a good friend of his, and sometimes I open up those emails with great trepidation, you know, from him. Um, I saw this but, piece uh, of shit you ran. The yeah, Atlantic right, <laughs> right. Can I give you a little bit of advice about working with a uh, with a contour line on the background and uh, the uh, and and they have a list. These students, uh, with, it's it's an assignment that they yeah. get, and they say contact somebody you like, and then I ask them these the following questions, and uh, and I would I would I would encourage. Some of those students, I always try to answer them best I can. Um, it's tedious. Sometimes I ask them to call me because I can't type very fast, um, and we can talk on a phone, and I'm happy to help. I've I've had some harrowing experiences with he- heroic illustrators who I admired, and when I went, when I that aforementioned thing about going to the Society of Illustrators, I would try to talk myself into going and talking to these guys, and I see them with their name tags, and I'd leave the bar, and I'd say to my friend who came out with me from Denver or San Francisco, I'm going to go talk and talk. I'm going to go to talk, talk talk to so and so. I think he's going to be. I'm just going to I'm just going to I'm just going to go right up there. I'm going to talk. I'm going to introduce myself. I don't know him well, but I'm going to say something. I'm going to ask him a little bit of advice. I'm going to say some nice things about him. I'm Ask if he's got any kind of. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. I don't want to get on the plane going back to Denver and not having done this. And you know, and a lot of those things did not work out. Like, I, I, I won't name the names, but some of those people are not exactly <laughs> what that I scared them away. Is that what you're thinking? Oh, I just mean with the the Bushimi like oh, you know build oh, up before yeah, that yeah. probably it's made not, it a little bit too. It nervous. is a little off putting. Yeah. I, 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 I get it. I can see you backing up as I was speaking. It's like no, no, um, that's, that's great, John. Oh, yeah, God. right. You got to wipe off this mic when I'm done. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, they, it, maybe that was it. Maybe that's what was what what, what put them off. But uh, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be. I'm never going to be as famous as he's got. I'm talking about. But I don't want to be that guy that sort of is approached and doesn't have some you know. And, and and is and sloughing these people off or pretending to look at somebody behind behind me and saying, "Listen, what was your name again?" Um, I, I've got, I've got, I'd, you know, I'd love to talk to you, but I you know, but I got I got, I got something. It doesn't really it does it, talking to you doesn't really worth be it. Does, it doesn't be being alone. I've got to get the fuck across the room, and get a drink, type <laughs> of thing. Um, uh, they were jerks to me, and uh, some of them. And uh, I don't want to be that guy, but I will say that I will ask you to sort of like uh, let these students know that were they if they've got to write that list to uh, illustrators and and, uh, and ask those questions. At least say, start the email by saying, hi, I like your work. Or, uh, or, or, or uh, Not just, just saying hi. Yeah. Instead of just saying, Sending an email saying, would you answer these questions? It's an assignment I've got to do or something. It's yeah. really uh, – you know, I'm not big on people skills myself, but you would think that uh, their teachers would at least say, introduce yourself and maybe lob this guy a compliment before you expect him to spend a half an hour pecking away on a keyboard answering your questions. But uh, – so I, but does that sound? That sounds like I'm, I'm bitter. I'm no, not. No, no, it just you know. sounds like those goddamn yeah. kids today. Which is yeah. uh, oh, again how I, how I led you into the I'm question. Not <laughs> and, and get out of my fucking yard. You lousy yeah. so and so. John, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual oh, Memory Show. It's man. my pleasure. Thanks for coming out here and talking. And that was John Cuneo. I enjoyed the heck out of his new collection, not waving, but drawing from Fantagraphics underground imprint. Uh, you could see John's work in major magazines and follow him on Instagram at John Cuneo three. That's J O H N C U N E O and the number three. He's also on Facebook. Um, he's got John dot com, but he hasn't updated that in a long time. Still, it's got lots of his artwork. And if you're listening to this in relatively real time, that is the week it comes out, John is going to be at Mocha Fest in New York City, Mocha Fest 2017, if you're not listening to this in real time. Um, it'll be at Mocha Fest on Sunday, signing copies of Not Waving But Drawing. Now, once we wrapped up the main session, I asked John, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear his answer to that before he descended into a puddle of neuroses, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories show so you can get access to our monthly podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. 
You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in in place for supporters of the show, uh, including that bonus podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, and I just got the first transcript in for what uh, promises to be a series of eBooks. We'll see if that happens. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. The other thing you should support on Patreon is The American Bystander, this great print-only humor magazine that uh, John is actually a contributor to. Um, look up The American Bystander, and you'll find out information about how to support that and, um, well, how to subscribe to it and make sure that they can keep putting out really amazing comics, sort of in the spirit of the old National Lampoon. Now, for my end, this one was recorded at John's home in Woodstock, so there was a toll on the New York Thruway, not that expensive, plus gas and time, but I got to say it was all worth it because I really enjoyed sitting down with this guy and talking. And I don't know if that really comes out over the course of this conversation. And probably all of you have bailed by now because this is just the outro stuff. But uh this was a really neat person to talk to. I really enjoyed sitting down with John and having this conversation. I'm hoping we can kind of keep it going. But we'll see. If you want to help defray some of the costs of doing the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, and equipment, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. Make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David, and you can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with author and friend Samuel R. Delaney. It's a weird one. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, Look up the Virtual Memories Show and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs>